that's the middle one. So I'm supposed to. Hi, and welcome to Occupy Ukiah for October 4th, 2012. Uh, this is Charlie Vaughn in the studio with Robin Sunbeam today. And uh, we're going to be uh, doing a lot of, uh, we're going to be showing some videos. We're going to be doing some uh, stuff on Move to Amend that Robin is uh, bringing to the show today. And we'll also be doing quite a bit on the um, Proposition 37 GMO labeling issue. Um, right off the bat, you can see I'm being upstaged by my dog Peaches. And that is because how many weeks have we been on here trying to give away a bag of free farmer's market bucks? There are 20 farmer's market coins in this bag. And if you come to our general assembly on Saturday at 10 o'clock and say the word localize, you will win this Chico bag, which opens up into a nice big produce bag. You can put your farmer's market produce in it. And $20 of, of market bucks that you can use at the Ukiah, Fort Bragg, Gualala, Redwood Valley, and uh, possibly one other that I can't remember at the moment. But it's quite useful, um, and it's free. You can also come to our, our direct action meeting on Sunday at 11 at KMEC Studio, the KMEC radio station, or the Mendocino Environmental Center. Uh, we meet there every day, every Sunday at 11. And if you walk in and say the word localize, you will receive this bag of $20 of farmer's market bucks. And it's important that we shop local. I saw a great bumper sticker that I would like to, I'm not a big bumper sticker fan, but I, I like it a lot. It says, buy local or bye-bye local. <laughs> and that's so true, because if we don't support our local stores and our local farmers, they won't be able to survive, and they're going to have to move to some place that will support them. So let's support local farmers, support your farmer's market, and come to one of our GA meetings or direct action meetings and say the word, localize and you will win twenty dollars of free farmers market bucks and a chico bag oh, woo. <laughs> and then peaches is gonna have to stay at home after that or maybe we'll find another reason to have her on here so we've got a pretty pretty big show today um, uh, our intro today we're gonna talk about um, the website the websites back up we're gonna uh, remind people about the radio show We've got some Move to a Man features with uh, Robin Sunbeam, who's here with us today. And then we're going to be showing videos um, <clears throat> about GMOs. So to start off, I uh, just want to say very happily our website is back up and running. And um, Tom was unable to maintain it. He had some health issues, Tom Ray, and um, he's feeling better and he's... Uh, set things up so that now we have a new guy who's going to run it for us and it's back online you can access our website at occupyukiah.info and on that website you can um, access archived radio shows you can access archived TV shows and uh, once we get it rolling a little further we will have uh, new events and um, different postings up that you can access. It'll give you information about when our general assemblies are and also when our direct action meetings are. So we're really happy now to have that central information uh, online kiosk of uh, OccupyUkiah.info. <clears throat> Let's move right on. I want to remind everybody that we have a radio show every Wednesday on KMAC Radio, 105.1 FM. And Bart Kaplan and Peter Good are your hosts. And um, it's every Wednesday at 5 o'clock till 6. It's an hour-long show. And they do, oh, they do audio um, stuff. And, you know, um, they'll play um, audio uh, recordings <clears throat> off of videos or whatever. And they will discuss um, occupied topics that we're involved in. Um, and like I said previously, you can also access um, past radio shows on the website, OccupyUkiah.info. So remember to tune in Wednesdays at 5 o'clock on KMEC Radio 105.1. 
All righty. Well, we're going to move right on into the meat of the show. And I want to introduce Robin Sunbeam. Hi, Robin. Great to have you on with us today. Hello. Thank and you. Thank you, Charlie. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here, and it's also my privilege. All right. All right. Um, we have some videos that Robin has brought. Um, Let's start with the video of David Cobb. David Cobb. Let's go to the David Cobb video. Um, here we go. <clears throat> this is going to be about four minutes and something. And we're going to go to the green screen and we'll jump right. Cobb was the uh, founder of the Move to Amend movement, which well, let you're me very. Tell, yeah, yeah, let why don't me you tell go you ahead, little, Robin? David Cobb is an attorney. And uh, he <clears throat> ran for uh, attorney general in Texas because he's from Texas and uh, on the Green Party. And then he, uh, he ran for president also on the Green Party, and I voted for him. <laughs> All right. And um, then he, uh, of course, he didn't win either of those, but uh, then in about, uh, I believe, 2008 or 2009, he, uh, well, he established Democracy Unlimited in Eureka, California, and an outgrowth of that is this huge coalition of uh, WILF and uh, the Alliance for Democracy and uh, so many other organizations that turned into Move to Amend. And uh, because it, he saw, like I saw, that, um, that the key issue to restoring democracy uh, is to get corporations out of the out of politics and so um, so he uh, I saw him uh, in 2008 or 2009 he came around to Ukiah and he gave uh, a lecture at the Mech and I was so impressed that I and some other uh, activists co-founded the uh, move to amend Ukiah affiliate and we started uh, taking action in our county. So for those um, watching who might not know exactly what Move to Amend is and why, why don't you fill in a little quick history on exactly what Move to Amend is about? Well, um, you see, uh, corporations have, well, corporations have been around for a long time, and corporations have been considered a legal fiction uh, in order to, under the law, in order to uh, sue a corporation and so the government can tax a corporation. But uh, somewhere around during the, uh, the Gilded Age, during the, when the robber barons or the railroad barons were uh, trying to uh, co-opt or buy our legislators, um, there was a Supreme Court decision based on uh, the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment had recently been passed, which gives equal protection under the law to any person. So uh, they started a series of Supreme Court decisions starting in um, 1886 and um, from there, uh, corporations have, have gotten personhood rights under the Constitution um, through Supreme Court decisions. You see, it's not laws created by Congress, and uh, it's, not, um, it's not done by the president. And so what's happened is the Supreme Court has granted corporations more and more rights so that at this point in history, corporations have more rights under the Constitution than human <laughs> and individuals. beings. And we'll be getting into some of that in your timeline presentation sure. in a little bit. So basically, the whole move to amend is, is um, a, a movement to amend the Constitution to say that corporations are not, in fact, people and money is not, in fact, speech. That's is that, am correct. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so that gives us a little background on, on what David Cobb is going to be talking about in this video. 
And then we'll be doing your timeline presentation, and we have another quick um, Tom Hartman video on this right. topic too, right? Which is also very pertinent to right uh, to what's what we'll be voting on in uh, excellent. In and November. we can get into describing exactly what we will be voting on um, as we're getting into the timeline. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Green screen, and here goes. United case. Can you just give us a real quick recap of what that what that case was? Sure. In January of 2010, the United States Supreme Court uh, basically overturned the McCain-Feingold campaign finance laws at the federal level uh, on the basis that those very anemic, very weak laws uh, treated corporations as an oppressed minority, uh, and now both corporations and trade unions and wealthy individuals can spend unlimited amounts of money in what are known as independent expenditures. They have flooded the, the political process uh, with bill, literally billions of dollars uh, and made it virtually impossible for we the people to actually have a democratic conversation during our election process. Okay. And so there, I forget exactly what your term was, but uh, essentially the Supreme Court felt that corporations are being discriminated against? Yeah, that's right. They, they, they claim that corporations are treated as an oppressed minority. An oppressed minority. Uh, and, of course, this is simply outrageous, David. And it's yet another example of the United States Supreme Court uh, working against the interest of ordinary people on behalf of the ruling elite and using the illegitimate illogical, completely stupid idea that somehow concentrated capital uh, uh, should have legal personhood rights. Remember that the United States Constitution protects the rights of human beings individually against uh, uh, their own government. Government should never have the right to actually infringe upon human beings' individual human rights. But anytime we the people pass environmental health laws, safety laws, worker protection laws, those laws should not be overturned merely because the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't like the, the, the effect. So we're going back two and a half centuries to f try and figure out what the founding fathers uh, thought about corporations. Did they, did they think about corporations? Well, they, What's the history? Well, they certainly did, David. I mean, uh, the reality is uh, uh, the, the founders understood very well what corporations were. Uh, the first 13 colonies were mostly corporations, in fact. In a very real way, we can understand that the American Revolution is not only a revolution against uh, the monarchy, against the idea of the divine right of kings, uh, but it's also a people's uprising against corporate rule. Uh, remember that the East India Corporation uh, was one of the main uh, business entities that was colonizing uh, uh, this country. Uh, in fact, it's worth pointing out that the, the American Revolution itself was a, uh, a, a, a reaction to uh, incredibly oppressive trade laws that were being passed in England on behalf of the East India uh, uh, corporation and a hundred percent of all of the members of parliament in England were actually shareholders in the oh. East India Corporation. So, you know, the, the founders were very clear and very, understood very well uh, what corporations were. And it's worth remembering, David Delk, that the the uh, first corporations that were chartered after the American Revolution were very tightly controlled. Before you could actually get a charter in this country for the first 75 years, you had to prove that there was a public need that was not being met. You had to get a bill passed by both houses of Congress and the governor signed it, so it was the functional equivalent of a law. Uh, you, that corporate charter would only be good for 10 to 20 years, at which point it automatically dissolved. and. All you could do with that corporate charter was the very specific uh, public need that you had alleged was not being met, either by government or existing business. And lastly, if you were ever found to act outside the public interest in any way, you were subject to having your corporate charter revoked even before that 10 to 20 year period. So yes, our, our founders understood very well what corporations were and very tightly controlled those corporations. I'm not saying this is the land of milk and honey for those Africans who were enslaved. It wasn't the land of milk and honey for women who were treated like chattel property. It wasn't great for the working class men of this country who were subject to indentured servitude. But the corporation as an instrument was very tightly controlled. And I heard you speak. Okay. Great explanation of that one. And um, 
Um, okay, you want to go to the uh, Tom Hartman video and then do your timeline? You want to do it no, that way? No, I want to talk a little bit about what he was saying. Okay, great. Let's Is do that. Is that, um, you know, the, the, the Boston Tea Party. A lot of people have heard of the Boston Tea Party. And uh, one of the factors there is that um, the British Parliament ha had a tax on tea, but they exempted the East India Company from paying that tax. Mm. And so all the small uh, uh, tea sellers, and everybody drank tea We're in those days, taxed. they had to pay the tax, but the East India Company was ex exempted from the tax. And that was the main reason that the uh, men dressed up as, as Native Americans and they boarded the ships. They actually asked the captains of each of those ships for the key to the hold and a promise not to damage the ships. And the captains gave them the keys and they threw all the tea overboard as a protest against the corporate uh, control of tea. So the captain knew that they were going to throw the tea into the bay? Gave them the keys. <laughs> All right. And the ships right. weren't damaged. Now, yeah, everybody always hears that the Boston Tea Party was just a revolt against taxes, which it actually sounds like it wasn't then. Well, it was a revolt ab against Un the fact that taxes. the corporation wasn't paying the taxes. Exactly. Exactly. It wasn't just a protest against taxes. That's yeah, correct. It was unfair taxation. That's right. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that feature. That's a great, great, uh, a great point. Um, so what, what's, um, what he was talking about is that what's, per, what's pertinent for us today is that um, corporations, well, corporations are buying our electoral politics. Right. And Move to Amend is not anti-corporation. Uh, move to Amend just wants corporations to, to be relegated to the economic sphere and keep them out of the political sphere. What I like to say is that we're trying to create a, a series of legislation that will make a wall of separation between corporation and state. And we're starting with trying to get the Constitution amended. And so, you know, constitutional amendments don't happen in counties. Right. And so um, a constitutional amendment has to either start in Congress and be ratified by state legislators, or else they could convene a constitutional convention of, uh, of state legislatures and then uh, propose whatever amendments they want. So in order to amend the Constitution, um, <clears throat> my understanding is that you have to get, is it a three-fourths majority in the, the House and the Senate? And then uh, a certain percent, like three-fourths of the states, all have uh, to two, ratify it? Is I that how it works? Two-thirds? Four, three-fourths of Congress and two-thirds of, of the, the states. states. So but it's it a could be the big, reverse. Tall I order. Never remember. It's not the kind of thing that's going to happen easily. There's a lot of work ahead. But the thing is that uh, 16 months ago, when we started this process, right. um, nobody except for David, David Cobb was even talking about a constitutional amendment. Right. And now we've been, we've been pushing this in, uh, in Mendocino County, and now we uh, succeeded in putting Measure F on the ballot. And, um, but since in this 16-month period, suddenly it's become the cause celeb. And now there's, you know, 15 different constitutional amendment proposals in both the, either the House or uh, the Senate. And... Um, but the, the thing about those, um, every one of those proposals have loopholes in them. Right. And now, for example, Bernie Sanders uh, <clears throat> gave a, a proposal for constitutional amendment. But his constitutional amendment has exempted nonprofits. And, you know, the Coke Industries has a nonprofit, Alec. 
right. ALEC is a nonprofit. <laughs> Hopefully it won't be for much longer. That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, <sighs> Citizens United is a nonprofit. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's a loophole that any corporate lawyer could, could, could drive a multinational corporation through that right. loophole. Right. And so uh, that's why uh, the, we, we at Move to Amend have a proposal that we're hoping that uh, we'll get a sponsor in Congress and they'll sponsor ours. Ours is ex very simple. It just says that constitutional rights are for human beings only and not for corporations and that money is not speech and can be regulated. So um, I'm sure people uh, might recognize you as having been out on the street a lot with your clipboard at all <laughs> kinds of events and in front of different stores and uh, getting a lot of signatures. And so I'm sure a lot of people uh, signed it and thought, okay, yes, I'm in favor of, of amending the Constitution and they'll probably vote for it too. Um, the signatures were just to get it on the ballot. It's now on the ballot and we'll be voting for it in November. So. Um, all that we are voting for, if I'm understanding it correctly, is that we, the citizens, are advising our representatives that we want them to move forward towards moving to a, towards amending the Constitution. Yeah, yes, this, so this is the case. There's going to have to be a lot more action to follow, even if this passes, which I'm guessing it's going to pass pretty overwhelmingly. I have a good feeling about it. Um, although it won't in itself accomplish a lot except get the ball rolling, so to speak. Well, it's part of a groundswell of right. public sentiment. Right. And you know how politicians are. They, you know, they yeah. always, they're always yeah. checking to see which way the wind is blowing and then that's who they represent. And in some ways that's the way they should be because they are our elected representatives and they're supposed to represent <sighs> to us. To some extent, yes. And so, you know, what in Measure <clears throat> F is a county-wide measure that only advises our state and federal lawmakers right. to amend the Constitution. Right. And, uh, and so it's just part of the groundswell and why do we need a, con a, a constitutional amendment? It's because once the Supreme Court has ruled, then the uh, Congress can't over override a Supreme Court decision, but a Supreme Court decision can override Congress. Yep. So the only way that we can solve the problem of corporate money or millionaires' money in, in the election is to, to uh, for a constitutional amendment. Yep. Um, how about if we go on to the Tom Hartman video and then do okay. your timeline? Sure. Should we do that? Okay, here we go. This is going to be uh, five minutes. And this is Tom Hartman. You can see him on uh, lookuptomhartman.com. This is also on YouTube. Um, Tom Hartman has a great show that I watch on Free Speech TV, which is on uh, the Dish Network. And, and he's also very Direct brilliant. TV. He's he's a great guy. So here we go with a video on Tom Hartman. It's just a coincidence that only a few months after the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision, Republicans are waging war against unions across the country, that the Koch brothers and billionaires on Wall Street are funding both directly and indirectly a variety of politicians from Scott Walker in Wisconsin to pretty much any anti-union Republican who sticks his head up. It's no coincidence. In fact, it's the final part of a plan enacted way back in 1886 by the wealthiest people in our nation to undermine our democracy and put in place one party rule in America. It all boils down to something called corporate personhood. And it's the basis of a book I wrote called Unequal Protection. Our founders knew all too well the dangers of corporate power. In fact, the Boston Tea Party was a protest against the world's largest transnational corporation at the time, the British East India Company. And through the first century of our nation, presidents, legislators, and the courts held that a a healthy mistrust of corporate power was a good thing. 
That was until just after the Civil War, when the 14th Amendment was passed, that gave former slaves access to our courts, equal protection under the law, by saying, no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. A simple, innocuous declaration, right? But there was a loophole in the 14th Amendment and explains everything that's going on in America today. Sixth, since the sixth century, British common law, on which ours was based, has distinguished actual people from other entities like government, businesses, and churches by declaring humans as natural persons, and corporations, governments, and churches as artificial persons. But since the 14th Amendment left out the word natural before the word person, corporations use that vagary and have since argued that they should be considered persons like you and me, because they're artificial persons and otherwise many of the other normal human protections under the Constitution. They should have them all. And in 1886, in the case of Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, the Supreme Court seemed to agree with this argument. But the truth we now know is that the court's decision was actually changed by a court reporter. And the court never really did give corporations rights as persons. Still, the idea struck stuck, excuse me, because of that same corrupt court reporter. Since then, a corporate person an entity that is not born, does not die, is neither male nor female, doesn't need safe water or clean food, cannot be put in prison, yet enjoys many of the same constitutional rights that you and I do, exists. They're now a super person. And this idea of corporations as people lay mostly quiet until the 1970s, when American corporations began to push it in front of the Supreme Court with decisions like Buckley versus Vallejo and First National Bank versus Bilotti, decisions that essentially expanded the rights of corporations based on the idea that they were persons. But it wasn't until January of 2010, last year, that the Supreme Court really blew the doors out, granting far fuller freedom of speech rights to corporations in their Citizens United decision, and thus the final piece of the puzzle was fit in for the Chamber of Commerce and America's transnational corporations and billionaires. Now, corporations, as people, could expand, the, could expand their influence into the markets and into the government. They now had unprecedented influence as a result of the Supreme Court decision about a year ago uh, over our society, and their intentions were not small-d democratic. With their new rights, some of the wealthiest oligarchs in America dumped millions of dollars from their private or corporate coffers into Republican political campaigns, and a, and a few, actually, and a, and a few corporate Democrats. And as a result of the new corporate spending, by and large, Republicans, the lapdogs of the CEOs and the billionaires, swept into the halls of Congress and governor's mansions in states all across the country. And today, those newly elected Republicans are repaying their corporate overlords by going after the last group left that's big enough or well-funded enough to challenge corporate power. The unions, who, because of Democratic, because the Democratic Party tends to be more pro-worker than pro-CEO, just happen to mostly contribute to Democrats. So for the billionaires and CEOs, the math becomes pretty simple. If you kill the unions, it's over. Welcome to one party, Republican corporate rule. We have to amend the 14th Amendment and insert that critical word, natural, before the word person. Because its absence in the last 150 years has mortally wounded our democracy. It's time to explicitly declare with this word natural before the word person. Explicitly declare once and for all, corporations <coughs> are not people. All right. I, I don't think you can state it any more clearly than that. Yeah, well, I just want to tell the, the viewing audience that when I was growing up, um, they, uh, my, my ed, the educational system <coughs> conflated uh, democracy with capitalism, and it conflated socialism and communism with dictatorship. And the, the main example they had was the Soviet Union, which 
never really fulfilled the uh, and communist China. or <clears throat> uh, right and Nazi Germany and some of those yeah and so what I want to say is that there really is <coughs> nothing democratic about a corporation a corporation is run from the top the people at the top make all the decisions and the people at the bottom obey and they have little or nothing to say about it on the other hand a trade union is totally democratic <coughs> because it is a a, a conglomeration <coughs> of many many people every one of those people has a say in what's going on they elect their delegates who go negotiate with the capitalists and uh, and then whatever decisions the delegates make nothing is ratified until the uh, rank and file members of the union vote on it and that is totally democratic and so uh, I just want to make it clear that capitalism is not democratic and so um, so he's talking about uh, how they're trying to cut unions out. Now we have, right. so th this, this decision of, uh, the, the decision uh, in 2010 of uh, Citizens United versus the Federal Elections Commission. What that did is it took the corporate personhood principle established by the court reporter in the head notes of the decision in 1886 and it put it together with the 1976 decision Buckley versus Vallejo and which said that political speech that money is political speech right. so in 2010 they said well if a corporation is a person and money is speech, then therefore corporations have the right under the Constitution to have free speech, which means that discriminating, not allowing corporations to spend as much money as they want on elections, is limiting their free speech rights. And so that's what opened up the floodgates for not just corporations, but corporations, nonprofits, and unions. So now we have a post Citizens United world where right now unions and uh, corporations and nonprofits are all on a level playing field. And so now we have uh, the ballot where we have Proposition 32. And what Proposition 32 is, is trying to do is skew the balance there in our post-Citizens United world and it's trying to take the teeth and claws out of unions by saying that unions cannot use funds that are deducted from your payroll for political purposes. Now where else do unions get money where do they get except their money? from your payroll <clears throat> deduction? And so they're trying to say that corporations can go ahead and spend as much money as they want on elections, but a union has to be prohibited from using their funds, yep. which comes from payroll taxes. So vote no on 32. Yep, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty... Uh pretty diabolical uh, set of mo really? movements we've got going on and um, that, that's why we've that's why we present this stuff because people don't pay attention it's so easy to get caught up in our in our life and click into the fun lane and watch TV go on trips right. have parties play you know sports or whatever and or just be working hard raising your kids and eating right and sleeping enough that takes up most of your life and meanwhile people who are getting paid really well are under current under the current under the radar and putting through stuff like this and your average person just can't follow it all you know it's so simple to have this stuff slip past us we're just average people 
And unless you, I didn't know some of these details, I'm really glad you're on today <laughs> because it, you know, I think I know a little bit about it. It's like, oh wow, I didn't know that part. I knew about 32, <clears throat> but that's why we're here. That's right. why we're here. So if you watch this, you can vote a little more intelligently. If you disagree with us, that's fine. I just want to make it clear also that living in a democracy <clears throat> and having freedom and liberty is not free. That uh, we live in a republic, a democratic republic, which means that the people are sovereign. We are the government. We are the people <clears throat> who are sovereign who because the population is so, so large that we can't vote in the town square anymore like they used to in Switzerland, that we elect representatives to elect us. But it is our obligation to tell our representatives what we want. Now, the reason uh, in our democracy, uh, we have to have a, an educated electorate. And so education is critical. And yet the, the education quality of our schools is going down. And um, I think, personally, I think that uh, some people are against, I think that the Republican platform against birth control and against uh, abortion is because they want many youths born who are unwanted. And then those unwanted youths will have a poor education, and then they'll have no other recourse but to join the military. And then, and where are the jobs anyway? You know, when I was growing up, Charlie, um, a corporation was not allowed to ship their, their, their factories abroad. There was a limit. You couldn't take more than like $12,000 out of the country at right, all. Right. But when Reagan was president, he changed that. A lot and, changed with him. And now you even get tax credits for moving your corporation uh, to another country. And so with the trickle-down yep. uh, trickle uh, economy and the Reagan revolution, We've enabled corporations to move their jobs out of uh, uh, an environment where unions, where unions uh, created uh, a higher standard of living and a blue-collar worker could buy a house, um, could have a single family member earn enough money to support the rest of the family. And then with the Reagan revolution and all the jobs going offshore, what's happened is that there's no manufacturing jobs left, uh, or very few. There's very few manufacturing <clears throat> jobs left. And, and instead, they're trying to break the unions, because one of the first things that Reagan did is he, he uh, broke the uh, air, controller, air traffic controllers union, and that was totally illegal. Totally illegal. I remember and when that happened, and he replaced them with, with scabs right. and never looked back. That's right. And unions have gone down since then. And, you know, it's true that back in the Jimmy Hoffa days, maybe there was some union corruption. But, a, you know, the unions are not corrupt like that, like Jimmy Hoffa, anymore. Well, and, I'm, I'm not sure if I would necessarily agree with that one. Okay. I think that corruption runs through society on both sides. Um, <clears throat> I have a friend who used to work at Todd Shipyard up in Seattle and build ships, and it was a very good union job. And there were people um, that he worked with, and they called them clock suckers. <laughs> and they would clock in, they'd find a great little place to sleep on the ship, and they would sleep through their shift and clock out, and they wouldn't do a dang lick of work the entire time. And that that is what has fueled a lot of the the <clears throat> um, I would say given given some of the some of the evidence that that the Republicans and so much and so many people say is wrong with unions. I think that we are responsible as a society for letting things 
degenerate to this point. And I wouldn't hold it 100% against corporations, and I also wouldn't hold it against unions, but I would say unions are also responsible for some of the rancor that is held against them. Um, well, I can see yeah. that. Yeah. I can see that there's corporation, there's <clears throat> corruption on, on either side. But what, what I really wanted to say is that when we let other people decide for us because we're too busy watching American Idol or we're too busy trying to just bring home enough money to make ends meet, when we cede our power to somebody else, then we've given it we've we've given our power away and it's time for us to to take responsibility and learn about what the issues are and make intelligent decisions and uh, you know I don't want a homogenous society <clears throat> where everybody agrees I, I think that uh, some people I, I love to debate with people who are uh, who think differently from me but one of the things I love about America is that I can live next door I can live next door to a person who, who, who thinks completely different from me and we can debate and agree to disagree and our children can still play together and I can still borrow a cup of sugar from them when I'm short and we can still go do things together even though politically we disagree. That's a very, very good point and I think also it's, it's upon us to remind politicians and elected officials, I use that quote, officials, that they are public servants. They are our Absolutely. public servants. And I think that we really make a mistake when we roll out the red carpet and the limos and the, you know, the right. first class everything for senators and, and all these people and treat them as if they're better than us. And oh my God, it's a senator. and and. They are, they are public servants. They're our servants. They are our servants. And I feel very, very strongly that what we are doing in the Occupy movement is serving the public. I don't feel like right. I am doing anything more than passing on information and gathering energy around certain topics and bringing it to the public's attention. And it's nothing more than serving the public and I think it's important that we remind ourselves and that we remind politicians that that is all they are and stop treating them like royalty which they tend to get treated like and it's it's really uh, it's really time we remind ourselves well a uh, part of the issue is that the um, the 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 media is owned by the profiteers, by the war profiteers and the oil profiteers. And so the media wants to dumb down the electorate. And they want to distract the electorate. And so they do that with celebrity worship. And that's why we're here. <laughs> I don't want. Don't yeah. worship me. The only celebrity worship we have going on is peaches, <laughs> I have to say. But other than that, that's why we're here. We're here to, to wise up the electorate. Exactly. With our vast viewing audience. <laughs> so um, so vote, can we move on yes. here? So vote yes on measure F. That's right. F yes. That's F what we yes. Say. F yes. Vote here. It says Corporations F are not yes. people. And this one says yes on F. That's right. That uh, tell our legislators that we want a constitutional amendment. F yes. F yes. And it's going to take us some time, and we can't give up on this one. We've got to stick to it. Um, so we don't need to do the <clears throat> timeline. Okay, I think, we've, to, I think we've followed yeah, historically we how have. we got into this mess. Uh, it's taken us a couple hundred years, and hopefully we can do it in the next 10 years uh, or sooner if uh, possible. I, I think it's going to happen way sooner. When we originally started, we had a 10-year timeline, but I think that it's been accelerated, and I think we'll have it done within three years. I would love that, huh? 
Okay, well, we are going to move on. Now we're going to move on to, um, <clears throat> to GMOs. And um, let's see, we've got Proposition 37 coming up in November. And that is um, re requiring that any GMOs be on the label of any food that is for sale in the store or any other place. And it only seems fair. Um, we can talk about it um, and get into the details. Let's watch Tom Hartman talk about it a little bit, and um, and we'll pick up on why it is important that GMOs be labeled. We also have a, an opposing opinion video tonight, which should be fun to watch. So for now, we're going to watch Tom Hartman. It's a five-minute uh, video, almost six minutes, on GMOs. If you were eating something completely unnatural, something that could make you sick, could give you cancer, make your testicles shrink, heck, even kill you, wouldn't you want to know? If you answered yes, then you're on the same side as over 90% of your fellow Americans. Poll after poll over the last few years has shown that more than 90% of Americans support specific labeling of genetically modified foods that they buy in grocery stores. And European and other developed countries r routinely require labeling of GMOs, genetically modified uh, organisms or foods. But even though for years Americans have been demanding the right to know what's in their food and whether or not it's franken food, not a single piece of state or federal legislation has ever been passed to make it happen. Which brings us to California. Efforts to force that state's legislature to pass laws to require labeling of genetically modified foods have failed. So now citizens of that state have taken matters into their own hands. After collecting more than a million signatures, the citizens of California put Proposition 37 on the ballot for November, which will force all genetically modified foods to have special labels. Good news, right? Well, now the fight is just starting. That's because the biggest purveyors of genetically modified foods, giant corporations like Monsanto, DuPont, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Nestle, all of them are spending enormous amounts of money to defeat Proposition 37. They don't want you to know what's in your food. Monsanto alone has spent more than four million bucks. So too has DuPont. And in total, the GMO industry has raised $25 million to kill Prop 37 and to kill your right to know what's in the food you eat. On the other hand, the supporters of Prop 37 have only raised $2 million. This is going to be an uphill battle. But here's why it's so important. And here's why corporations like Monsanto don't want Prop 37 to pass. Despite what we've all been told, despite the assurances that GMOs are not dangerous to humans, evidence to the contrary is startling. A few weeks ago, I had a conversation with Jeffrey Smith, the executive director of the Institute for Responsible Technology and author of the book Seeds of Deception, exposing industry and government lies about the safety of the genetically engineered food you're eating. And here are some of the amazing things he told me that you should know just as this battle in California picks up. When a lawsuit was filed against the FDA, they were forced to turn over their secret internal memos, 44,000 of them. And it turns out that the statement in the policy was a lie, that it was actually the overwhelming consensus among the scientists working at the FDA that GMOs were dangerous and should be carefully tested. They warned against toxins, allergens, new diseases, and nutritional problems. This is called potentially precancerous cell growth. There's no tumors yet found, but it's proliferative cell growth. For some reason, the cell architecture is completely different in the rats that ate the genetically modified potato. Right. But here's the scary thing. When a pediatrician named Michelle Perro saw these research studies, she said, uh-oh, we've got a problem. This is what we're seeing in our children. She has seen... Wow. Changes in the digestive capacity and the just digestive effects in children that are different than they were 30 years ago. Kids that are allergic to everything, or have failure to thrive, can't eat anything. And we see that this kind of disruption may be uh, throughout the American population because inflammatory bowel disease is up 40% since GMOs were introduced, colitis, ulcers, etc. They took the BT toxin out of Monsanto's corn, applied it to human cells. It poked holes in the cells, causing leakage, the same kind of holes that may kill insects. One of the scientists that I work with gave a talk in Germany and described the behavioral, physiological, and neurological changes in laboratory animals and livestock that were fed genetically modified feed. And an autism specialist came up to him afterwards and said, these are exactly what we're seeing 
and autistic children. The gastrointestinal problems, the gut permeability, the changes in the bacterial balance and behavioral changes are found in the rats, in the mice, in the pigs, in the cows that they've been tested. And now in our kids. In our kids. I visited one village where they had allowed their buffalo to graze on normal cotton plants for eight years. They allowed them to graze on BT cotton plants for a single day, and all 13 buffalo died. Are you astounded yet? If not, watch the rest of my conversation with Jeffrey Smith on the web at conversationswithgreatminds.com. But the point is, 60% of the food in our grocery stores is now genetically modified. And considering everything Jeffrey Smith was saying, people are increasingly wondering if it's more than just a coincidence that the proliferation of GMOs has occurred in line with an explosion in cases of breast cancer, autism, gluten allergies, and a series of other diseases that you don't see in other nations that have taken a hardline stance against GMOs. We may be quite literally poisoning ourselves. The Declaration of Independence declares that all of us have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, life depends on food. Food that doesn't kill us or make us sick. So out of that, we all have a right to know what's in our food and whether it's natural or not. This battle is being fought in California right now with huge amounts of corporate cash being used to block your right to know what's in your food. We may win that battle, we may not. But in the long run, we need to keep fighting to ensure that all Americans are receiving the information they need when they go to the grocery store to make an informed decision about what they put in their bodies. Otherwise, we're all just blindfolded, trusting Monsanto to feed us their test tube foods. We need GMO labeling now. Okay, that's a little bit more Tom Hartman. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, you've been seeing uh, Vandana Shiva videos on here um, for the last two shows. And uh, there's some more supporting evidence. Basically, <clears throat> Monsanto and the other corporations that are uh, making GMOs are out of control. And once again, this ties into Move to Amend. This ties into corporations running things. This ties into corporations setting policy in our country and us basically having no say about it. Um, we have some other videos on here where they will talk about how many millions of acres have been planted in GMOs freely around this country. <clears throat> it's out of control. They are making genetically modified insects and releasing them. Um, the largest and most successful and most perfect laboratory that exists is Mother Nature. All of the plants and animals and, and lichen and mushrooms and insects and everything that exists has gone through the fire of evolution, trial and error. If it, didn't, if it wasn't strong enough, if it wasn't viable, it didn't survive. <clears throat> so what, what we see around us now is a perfect balance of continual trial and error evolution. And it takes thousands upon thousands of years for any species to come, to, to come into existence. <clears throat> and the rate that, at which we are destroying the um, genetic base and destroying animals and plants and turning our food system into a monoculture is truly shocking. We are working at an incredible pace. And the question is whether we are going to outwit ourselves out of existence. Are we going to be just clever beings who, who totally outwit ourselves into extinction or are we going to wise up and gain some measure of wisdom so that we can survive. It's time for us to, to put the brakes on Monsanto. These things have been put out in the, in the environment with less testing than probably a car gets before it's put on the road. <clears throat> anyway, we could go on. Yeah. yeah, what do you think, Robin? Well, <laughs> you know, Monsanto is a big corporation, a multinational corporation. And corporations only need one thing to live, profit. And profit is the main reason that they exist. And so they don't care if the 
if it harms people or if this, the, uh, it pollutes the water, the soil, or the air, the important thing for a corporation is to make profit. Now, even if Prop 37 passes, the corporations will take it to the Supreme Court and use their personhood rights <coughs> to defeat it. And so uh, there's an example uh, from 1996. Uh, it's a Supreme Court decision uh, that took place in Vermont called International Dairy Association versus Amistoy. And what happened there is that the, the legislature of Vermont voted that they wanted all dairy products from Vermont labeled uh, for, um, for human growth hormone. BSG, I think it was called. Okay. Uh, bovine, I thought, uh, bovine, 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 something, something. That's yeah. right. BSG. And I so uh, <clears throat> the the state created a law in their legislature that was the will of the people, and so International Dairy Foods Association took it to the Supreme Court and won and defeated and overturned that law on the basis of their free speech rights. Now, where, where, what do you think is free speech? Well, the, the court decision was that free speech implies not only speaking, but the right not to speak. And because the corporation, because International Dairy Foods Association has <coughs> the right of free speech because they are a person under the Constitution, thanks to the Supreme Court, they also have the right not to speak. So the right of the, of the people of Vermont to speak was overturned and overpowered in the Supreme Court by the right of International Dairy Foods Association not to speak. So, um, and so until, to me, uh, getting corporate personhood eliminated from the Constitution is the fundamental, most important thing that if we want Prop 37 to, to, to pass, I mean, is to be the law of the land, then we, we have to stop the corporations from taking it to a Supreme Court that'll give it more favor than the human beings. So basically, um, it was required after that that, um, that the BSG or BGH, bovine growth hormone. BGH. Um, it, some acronym, but anyway, it was a hormone that was synthetically um, engineered that they injected into the, into the cows um, which made them uh, produce like a third as mu third more, more milk. milk. Yeah. And it also shortened their life and created tumors and all kinds of things. And people right. were very concerned about what was the long-term effect of us actually ingesting this hormone in our children right. and in us. Um, and so uh, since that time, it has been required that that is on labels, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, I don't know. I just sure know that, that it was defeated in the Supreme Court in 1996. <clears throat> okay. I remember when that was going on. I thought that that had to be, but perhaps it hasn't because I remember for a long time there it said no BGH or BST or whatever that acronym was, and people were claiming that they weren't using it. But um, so well, you're saying B that it BPH is in plastic. And they found BPH in the plastic of baby bottles. And as, as a matter of fact, it's in the plastic of the water yeah, bottles. It's BPA, that is, it's bisphenol A. Oh. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> right. that, that's, that's different. So, uh, you know, it's remarkable yeah. that all of the countries in the European Union have the GMO labeling law. Exactly. There's how many? Exactly. There's like 57 50. countries. Yeah that have a GMO labeling law. And now we're not making it illegal to put GMOs in. What we're doing is we're just giving people information, the, the to right choose. to know exactly. so that people can choose for themselves. So what's wrong with that? Well, let's listen to Dennis Kucinich really quickly. Uh, it's a minute and 18. And he uh, <clears throat> is... Um, in the House of Representatives here. 
speaking out. Let's go to the green screen here. In 1992, the Food and Drug Administration decided that genetically modified organisms were the functional equivalent of conventional foods. They arrived at this decision without testing GMOs for allergenicity, toxicity, antibiotic resistance, and functional characteristics. As a result, hundreds of millions of acres of GMO crops were planted in America without the knowledge or consent of the American people. No safety testing, no long-term health studies. The FDA has received over a million comments from citizens demanding labeling of GMOs. 90% of Americans agree. So why no labeling? I'll give you one reason. The influence and the corruption of the political process by Monsanto. Monsanto has been a prime mover in GMO technology, a multi-million dollar GMO lobby here, and a major political contributor. There is a chance that Monsanto's grip will be broken in California, where a GMO labeling initiative is on the ballot. And here in Congress, my legislation, H.R. 3553, will provide for a national labeling bill. Americans have a right to know if their food is genetically engineered. It's time for labeling. It's time for people to know how their food is being produced. So, Charlie? Yeah. I also uh, <clears throat> have been hearing about epigenics. Have you heard much about epigenics? Uh, possibly. It sounds well, familiar. It used to be that we thought that um, the DNA in our cells was, right. was static and permanent and unchanging. Right. But now it turns out that there are countless, countless potentials in the DNA. And so it's the, what we are exposed to that turns on or turns off certain parts of our DNA. And so uh, when we're exposed to BT corn or the, they're, they're saying that the cows that eat the BT corn, apparently there's some organism they're finding in the flesh of those right, cows. Right. And that, they haven't identified the organism yet, but they're finding the organism in the milk. And then when a mother drinks that milk, the organism gets into the human being and then when the baby is born, that organism is in the cord blood of the newborn. Right. It's passed on. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's why we're jumping into so many of these amazing, miraculous technologies. I mean, it's really, it is truly miraculous that we have cracked the genome. <laughs> it really is. It's yeah. amazing that we can now read the codes and figure out all this amazing stuff. And what bothers me is, is the therefore. It's like, therefore, now that we know this, we're going to just throw all this stuff into the, into the environment, and it'll be fine because we know what we're doing. Nature <laughs> is basically simple, you know. Don't make it so complex. And so, um, you know, I was, I was watching something just the other night where uh, uh, early on when, uh, when uh, antibiotics were first developed, um, a scientist discovered that um, the the chickens were eating the mash that was the, they grow they grow I think it was tetracycline um, at, it, with a with a yeast culture mm. and they had a leftover mash from making tetracycline and they were just putting it in big piles outside of of where they were making this and this guy was found out that the chickens that were eating this tetracycline were huge. They were big and they were healthy, and they looked into this and they started feeding tetracycline mash um, and tetracycline after a while to all these animals and they started studying them and they were giant and healthy and they thought this is a wonderful thing and this was one of the ways that antibiotics got introduced into the livestock culture so that all the chickens and beef and pigs and all that stuff that are that we now buy the meat of in the store has antibiotics into it. Uh, it's part of the industry now. And then, right. whoops, all of a sudden, uh, what is it, 40-something years later, we've discovered maybe that wasn't such a good idea because, yeah, we did grow larger animals, and they seemed to be healthier because they weren't uh, being held back by this particular uh, bacteria that was in their gut. 
that got eliminated. So it looked like a wonderful thing. And now we found out what? We've grown superbugs right. that are resistant to the exactly. antibiotics. And so we jumped into it. And now, lo and behold, we're down to one or two antibiotics that are effective anymore. If, and there are now super infections that people have gotten that no antibiotics will touch. Right. And what are we going to find out, lo and behold, 30, 40, 50 years down the line, the effect of ge genetically engineered foods on our bodies, on the soil, on other plants, on other animals yeah. that support the entire system that we live off of. We've jumped into things way too fast. Um, yeah. These things are truly miraculous, but we have no patience. And that's where the wisdom comes in. Are we going to wise up? Or are we just going to totally eliminate ourselves through our own little cleverness? We're very clever. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we invented an atomic bomb, and that's now right. we have enough atomic bombs to wipe ourselves off the that's planet. That's right, and it's amazing we haven't <laughs> managed that. Well, we've got another video here that I'd like to go to. This one, we'll have to refrain from laughing. This is the Libertarian case against mandatory GMO lab labeling. This is the Libertarian representative that I found online, and she's very um, uh, appealing and adorable, and she just doesn't have a whole lot to say. Uh, anyway, here we go to the green screen. This is going to be a controversial video within the Liberty Movement, but I'm going to do it anyway. There is this health movement within the Liberty Movement that has really sprung up over the past year or so. Many of these people are against genetically modified foods, and that's fine. But what I find disturbing is a growing number of libertarians are pushing for government mandates on food companies to label GMOs. GMOs are genetically modified organisms. Let me repeat that. Government mandates. Government mandates should go against everything that libertarians believe in. Oh, before I get accused of being in bed with the food corporations, I am opposed to corporate welfare of any kind. I am against any subsidy to the food industry. I just believe in a free market. To me, a free market is the separation of market and state. The free market is not perfect but it beats any alternative any day of the week. Some people think that GMOs are extremely bad for you. Okay, but that doesn't justify government mandates. It's inconsistent to want to get the government out of the food industry, but then you want the government to force companies to label their food. Let's focus on getting the government out of the food industry. Let's not give more power to the FDA. That's moving in the wrong direction. Some people say that it's fraud if companies are not labeling GMOs. To me, it would be fraud if a company said that a product doesn't have GMOs in it, and it actually did. You might have a case for fraud there. But the free market has a solution. Companies should be free to label their food as genetically modified or non-genetically modified. Now you might say, well, no company is going to label their food genetically modified because a lot of people wouldn't buy it. Well, that might be true, but look on the other side. There are companies who would label their food non-genetically modified if there's really a demand for non-GMO food. It's really up to the consumer to be educated and make good decisions. We can't rely on the government to hold our hands in order for us to make good decisions. The problem is not lack of government regulation. People supporting these government-mandated food labels don't have a lot of faith in the free market. Many companies already voluntarily label food. This is why we have stores like Trader Joe's and Whole Foods. At Trader Joe's, any food with a Trader Joe label on it promises no artificial colors, no artificial preservatives, no genetically modified ingredients, no MSG, and no trans fats. But how does this all happen without government mandates? Because the free market responds the best to the people. This is why we have the Non-GMO Project. It's a website. Look it up. It contains a list of all the companies and products that do not contain genetically modified ingredients. It's all voluntary. People should vote with their wallets. This is why the meat production company AFA filed for bankruptcy because of the whole pink slime controversy. Advocating for government mandates 
is anti-free market. Anyone concerned with GMOs can refuse to buy and even boycott companies who refuse to label. And they can purchase food from companies that are labeled non-GMO. It's pretty simple. I think she had a lot of good points, actually. And it wasn't that outlandish. It's just that, you know, she has a high value for free market. But in fact, there's nothing about free markets in the Constitution. And there's nothing that in the Constitution doesn't mention anything about uh, corporations or, uh, or markets. The, our government is designed to protect us, to protect the people. Uh, I can, uh, you know, the government, our government is designed to, to serve the people. And she was talking about the government as something that's against the people. Exactly. But, but the government is there. They are our servants. They are here to protect us and serve us. And so, um, you know, I think she had a point about, you know. The uh, labeling. Yeah, I think that... Um, but, but what if you're going through the store and you uh, are looking at, at, a, at an item or, or 10 items? How big is this label going to have to be? Does not contain artificial flavor, does not contain artificial... Does not contain, does not contain GMOs, doesn't contain plutonium, doesn't... Oh, wait a minute, if you don't have a Geiger counter, are you sure it doesn't... Contain? The point is, is she is saying that that the free market can just put anything out there and you just have to know better. You have to know, oh, I better not buy that box of Wheaties or I better not buy a uh, Hidden Valley soup or whatever the heck you might be buying because y you don't know what's in it if they aren't required to label, right? So I think it's ass backwards. I think it's upon the, you know, it's, it's the old buyer beware. Right. Well, that's fine. But right now, what have we got? We've got GMOs that are being planted all over our country without our consent. Exactly. And we don't have anything to say about it. And they want to put it into our food without telling us. Exactly. And so we're supposed to, as consumers, do a bunch of research and try to figure out which items do have this and which items don't have that. And there's talk about bringing back DDT. <laughs> do we want to have that added to the well, It doesn't have DDT. It doesn't have this. It doesn't have that. You're not going to have anything but a huge label with a bunch of tine, fine line print. Well, as a, as a nurse, yeah. I understand that every one of our foods already has a label. Right. And the label tells you the nutritional content of the food. It tells you how much sugar, how many carbs, how much fiber, how much protein, how much fat, how many calories. Right. And so to, uh, it's already labeled. And, and that is a, a, a mandate in every state. And it tells you unit. what's in it. That's and it right. makes much more sense to tell you what is in it rather than what's not in it. That's which was right. what she was exactly. proposing. She was saying, well, you know, uh, it could say no GMOs in this. Well, that'd be one thing. But it, it, it's a crazy stance, in my opinion. Um, it's absolutely putting it on the consumer to know somehow what is in this food that isn't, isn't labeled. And believe me, that even if we get GMOs, even if this passes, which is another one I really believe will pass widely. I think people are very in favor yeah. of this. Vote yes on But 37. nonetheless, we can't give up if it does pass because um, it was required that MSG be um, required to be put in ingredients. That it, if, it, if it contains MSG, it's supposed to be put in the label. Well, then the, the uh, monosodium glutamate um, lobby, which is one of the largest food lobbies in the world, mm. got something like 80 different ways that that MSG can be put into food without putting the words monosodium glutamate on it. Mm. And natural flavoring is one. So when <laughs> natural you see flavoring. natural flavoring, <laughs> natural that flavoring. does not necessarily mean anything. It can mean that it has MSG in it. So 
If we require GMOs to be labeled, watch it because they are very tricky fellows and we may not get exactly what we vote for. So um, we've got one more video here and it's kind of a pleasant one. Um, I've been involved um, with uh, the Fukushima Response Group um, which is out of, uh, they're in Petaluma and they are really a wonderful bunch of people and that movement has sprung up out of the Occupy Petaluma um, group and I've been so impressed with what a creative, cohesive, uh, smooth running group this is. They communicate quite well. I've uh, been following their emails um, and they created a really cool chalk art presentation about GMOs. One of their, uh, one of their members named Tim Nahn who um, was big on the, uh, on the um, foreclosure uh, topic in Occupy Petaluma, um, he wrote a fairy tale about GMOs and they got some really good artists to draw out his fairy tale, his story on the sidewalks in Petaluma. And um, I've got a short video here it's a it's a seven minute video and it's really worth watching and this will be our last video of the night um, of what they did um, in Petaluma <clears throat> and it is gone now but I'm I haven't dug it up yet but we will be seeing a frame by frame video um, at least that I can lead you to the link of in the future so um, this was done by, um, uh, I, actually I think I don't need to tell you who it's done by because all the uh, credits are going to be shown at the end. So let's just watch the GMO chalk art, uh, it was September 1st, 2012. different to bring this bef our initiative before the public in a creative way and Tim is a writer so he said well what if I write a, a storybook and we could do it a sidewalk storybook and do it in chalk and get some artists and the people in the community involved in it and the story storyline or text would talk about genetically engineered foods and the problems that they could potentially have for people. Over 90% of the corn in this country is genetically modified. 
it's controlled by the chemical corporations. So if you go to a fast food restaurant, you get your hamburger, your fries, and your soda. Your hamburger is from meat that's been fed or genetically modified corn. Your soda is high in high fructose corn syrup. Your potato chips are most likely cooked in corn oil. So your entire meal has in some way, shape or form been in contact with genetically modified organisms. Most of the packaged foods, if it's not organic in this country, contains genetically modified organisms. And yet, we do not have to label the fact that the food comes from GMOs. There are many studies uh, in laboratories and in farm animals that indicate that the organs of animals that have been fed genetically modified foods, i.e. genetically modified corn in their feed, that when those animals eventually are slaughtered, the organs are substandard. Proposition 37 will require the labeling of packaged genetically modified foods. Chalk paintings are a great medium for public art because so many people get to be involved. I did the designs, but uh, it's so great to have all these people's energy put into this together. And uh, so this is a transitory type of artwork because we know it's going to vanish very quickly. But all the energy that goes in here is a great communicative uh, mode. So it's just fun to have that, it's colorful and uh, people enjoy it and uh, the message is there and so uh, I just love having everybody's input in this and, and I'm keeping the drawings, the original drawings and uh, we can use that for future references as well. If you, as a consumer, want to consume genetically modified foods, more power to you. If it's labeled, you can identify it and purchase it. If it contains GMO. Well, I think that we are running ahead of our buffering speed here, and we're going to have to uh, cut that off. I'm sorry to say. Um, that was um, shot by a, a wonderful guy named uh, John Bertucci, who um, is a member of the Occupy Petaluma group. Anyway, uh, there's some talk um, about perhaps doing a Fukushima storyboard on the sidewalks in the near future. And I'm really hoping that we could do something like that here in Ukiah. And you were involved in chalk art through the Montessori school, weren't you? R not the Montessori or, uh, school, excuse me, but the Waldorf. we, did, Waldorf, we yeah. did the pastels on the plaza. I did right. that for several years. And um, and uh, I and um, uh, two other people got together and started pastels on the plaza. And then uh, in the third year, I sponsored it myself. And um, yeah, 
but I certainly know how to organize that kind right. of thing. You know, <laughs> I, I really wish that not only were human foods labeled, but animal feeds, because, uh, you know, yeah. I keep poultry, and um, my, I, you know, I don't know what, fe what I'm feeding my poultry. The organic uh, poultry feed um, is twice as expensive as the regular feed, and my, my hens won't even eat it. They don't even like it. Mm. And so um, I just buy, you know, a combination of regular feed and my animals like that. But if it's GMO, which it probably is, but I don't know since it's right. not labeled. Right. And then that gets into the eggs and I eat those eggs. I think we've finished buffering now. Maybe we can just finish up the last part of this video. I would like for people to be able to see the credits. Uh, if we can go back to the green screen and finish up here. You do not want to purchase it if it's labeled, you have a choice. So we believe that this is truth and labeling, and it's pretty much a no-brainer. wanted to make sure we saw the end of that. It's such a great video and um, I'm, I'm really thinking it might be a good thing for us to do <clears throat> perhaps. Uh-oh. We're just going to turn the sound off. <laughs> we had another video come up off of YouTube there. I don't know what happened. Anyway, uh, it's possibly something we could do for Fukushima. Tell the story of Fukushima in chalk art. Um, I'm afraid we might have to wait till next spring or summer yeah, till the rains have stopped. We would, but it would take but, it would take uh, six months to organize it. Right, and perhaps we could do it under the cover at uh, at uh, Alex Thomas Plaza right. uh, in the winter time. Anyway, that's something for the future. Um, a couple of really quick items here before we go that I would like to throw in. There is going to be a no nukes rally in front of the Japanese consulate. 50 Fremont Street in San Francisco on October 11th. Um, and you know me, I'm, I'm all about uh, the whole nuclear issue these days, and I want to remind people that Fukushima is hotter than it was when it first started. It is more dangerous than the, the day of the earthquake and the tsunami, and things are not getting better in Fukushima, and they won't be anytime soon. And it's really upon us to educate ourselves, and I will continue to bring things to this, to this show to help us all learn about the dangers of nuclear energy and also the amazingly critical, just insane situation that is happening every second that we sit here in Fukushima there is radioactive water leaking into the ocean and radioactive water, uh, radioactive uh, isotopes leaking into the groundwater in Fukushima. And also there is, uh, there is a danger of a hydrogen explosion because three of those reactors have melted down completely and it's speculated, although there's no way of proving it, <coughs> that that nuclear fuel is burning down into the earth and if it hits a solid layer of water it could have a hydrogen explosion that would then blow the uh, containment vessel open and release an incredible amount of radiation into the atmosphere that's three radioactive that's three reactors that that could happen in it's not good odds things are not getting better there um, and also along those lines Mr. Yastel Yamada uh, is returning to the United States. You saw the video here. We talked a lot about him. Um, uh, there's a great, this is just a prototype of the poster that they're going to be putting out. That is Yamada-san in, uh, in his work clothes. Um, he is uh, volunteering to help clean up the worst of the radio radioactive mess at Fukushima. He and uh, 800 other uh, retired elders in Japan have volunteered this. Um, 
actually whether or not they are allowed to do this is really not the point the main point is he is bringing the truth of what is happening at Fukushima out to the world and Mr. Yamada is going to be down in the Bay Area and I will be uh, releasing the uh, the dates um, of that and I'm sorry I don't have them today um, but actually I'll probably be going on the Occupy Ukiah Airwaves show on Wednesday so tune into that and you will hear uh, some of the dates that he will be speaking and he's going to colleges because what they found out was what at his last tour where he went to San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Washington DC, New York, um, Boston <clears throat> and little tiny Ukiah, he was here at Ukiah um, what they found out was over 90 percent of his audience was over 50 years old and that is um, a statement of who's paying attention right now I believe the youth are paying attention, uh, but I also believe the youth got very disillusioned um, with some of the uh, letdowns over Barack Obama's uh, presidency and also the letdown that Occupy did not change the world in six months. And um, as a result, right now the gray hairs are, are carrying the torch. And so Mr. Yamada is going to colleges and trying to bring the information to college students to see if he can get young people to get reactivated to bring the message out into the public that Fukushima is in beyond an urgent situation and it needs international attention and that we need to tell our representatives to put pressure on the Japanese government to allow outside help we need all the best minds on the planet to work on this planetary threat. And then he's going to be possibly uh, doing a European tour. So the man's not giving up. And we'll be bringing more information about Mr. Yamada and the whole, uh, the whole nuclear issue to the show. You, I'm not giving up. And like I say, the radiation's not going away, and I'm not either. So uh, you can count on, on more, uh, more information being brought out. And um, unless you have anything more to add, uh, Robin, uh, we're going to go to our... Well, I just wanted to mention also that I recently, uh, I'm kind of a database whiz, <clears throat> and I recently uh, went through the database of the, of the uh, registered voters in Mendocino County, and I was shocked to see that the 95%, in my opinion, were um, 55 and up. And so I hardly saw any uh, registered voters in the ages of their 30s, and very, very few, my two sons, were registered to vote, but very, very few youths. And so uh, I'm planning to go to uh, Mendocino College next week and register people to vote. Yay, way to go. That's awesome. Well, we're going to go to our Howard Zinn quote of the day. He's my favorite guy to quote, and we'll be closing out the show. Um, if you want to go to the green screen here, um, you can read it along with me. What most of us, and Howard Zinn was talking, I believe, to uh, authors and filmmakers um, when he was quoted. And just, you can add in whatever any of us are doing. What most of us must be involved in whether we teach or write, make films, write films, direct films, play music, act, whatever we do has to not only make people feel good and inspired and at one another's and, and at one with other people around them, but also has to educate a new generation to do this very modest thing, change the world. And I believe that it's upon us, all of us, to pass this activist way of life on to our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren as long as we are around because the only way that we got into this mess is that we allowed it to happen exactly. collectively as a people, as a society. Globally, we allowed a lot of shit to go down that should not have gone down. And it's only because we, uh, we looked away and trusted 
our representatives and our business people with the steering wheel. And it's time for us to put them in the back seat and take the controls back. Yeah. And we need to pass that on. All right. Thanks, All right. Charlie. Great, You're awesome. Great having you on today, Robin. And hopefully we can do this again. And I think that's about all. We had a nice long show today. Hopefully it was informative. And uh, so for uh, Robin Sunbeam and Charlie Vaughn, we're signing off, and we'll see you around town.